so I think we can get started. Um, are the participants all in the uh, Zoom session, or how does that work? Uh oh, there we go. I'm back. <laughs> Excellent. It's hard to tell uh, if we're live or not, but I'm guessing we're live on the platform at Columbia. Uh, and we'll get started with the panel now. It's about it's a little after 6.30. Um, so thank you everyone for, for joining us tonight for this panel. Uh, it's the title of tonight's panel is Stories of Sea Level Rise, Creatively Communicating the Impacts of Climate Change. And in tonight's panel, we're gonna hear from four different creative st storytellers who've been documenting sea level rise, managed retreat and climate change over the last decade. Our panelists are Julie Dermansky, Josephine Holtzman, Isaac Kestenbaum, and Elizabeth Rush. And I'm really happy to have them all here this evening. Um, my name is Nathan Kensinger, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. I'm a filmmaker and a photographer and a journalist and an artist who's been documenting New York City's waterfront for the last 15 years, uh, with a particular focus on how sea level rise will reshape the city's 520 miles of coastline. And I decided to convene this panel uh, after presenting at Columbia's last managed retreat conference, which was in 2019. Uh, um, at that conference, I screened uh, my short documentary, which is uh, actually also titled Managed, managed Retreat, and which is an observational film about New York City's first managed retreat process, which is taking place in three neighborhoods in Staten Island. Uh, and it was great to be part of that 2019 conference and to be in dialogue with so many people in the academic and scientific community uh, but I remember thinking at the time that I might be the only artist who was presenting at the conference, or maybe the only filmmaker, or definitely one of one of the only photographers and journalists who was there. So I'm really glad to see this year that the conference has included many more creative voices, including uh, colleagues like Virginia Anusik and Eve Mosher and Sarah Cameron Sund, who are all on panels later in the conference. Uh, and of course, our guests on today's panel, who are all excellent uh, creative storytellers. Uh, all four people that we're going to be hearing from today have been creating work around sea level rise and climate change that's truly exceptional. Uh, and I have a great amount of respect for all the work that they do, and also for their commitment to creatively telling stories from the front lines of climate change and sea level rise. They've all spent years in the field working with communities that are facing issues of relocation and retreat. They've used many different storytelling techniques, including podcasts and sound walks and photo essays and creative nonfiction. And they've reached totally unique audiences uh, with their work. So thank you to, to each of you for being here tonight, uh, Julie, Josephine, Isaac, and Elizabeth, and for taking the time to be with us. Um, a little note about how tonight's gonna go. Uh, most of the time today is gonna be used for a discussion and a conversation amongst all of us uh, so that we can kind of really just talk about some of these these issues of how to how to creatively um, tell stories of, of sea level rise. But first, each participant is going to do a brief presentation uh, about their work to give us some background on, on where they're coming from. Um, and I'll, I'll read a bio before uh, each person does their their presentation. But I thought we might start with Elizabeth Rush, um, who is a visiting lecturer in the Department of English at Brown University, and the author of Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore. Uh, this book from 2018 was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction, and it visited communities impacted by sea level rise and climate change and dealing with managed retreat around the United States. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times and Harper's, uh, Guernica, and many other publications. And Rush is also the recipient of fellowships from the National Science Foundation and National, National Geographic, Andrew Mellon, uh, Society for Environmental Journalism, uh, and the National Society of Science Writers. She teaches at Brown University and is currently at work on a book about motherhood and Antarctica's diminishing glaciers. So I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth to sort of set the tone with a, a reading from her book. Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you so much for convening us. Um, I have to say, I remember when this conference happened last year and I was really sad that I couldn't make it. I had just given birth to my son, so it was sort of not in the realm of possibility, but um, I'm thrilled to be here with you all tonight and excited to share a little bit um, from my book, Rising, that Nate was telling you a little bit about. I think what I'm gonna do 
today is read a short excerpt from the book. Um, I should say sort of two different things to orient you sort of in time and space. One is that Rising tells the story of eight different coastal communities all around the United States already coming to terms with sea level rise. And it sort of asks, what do those living on the front lines of climate change know that the rest of us do not? So it's not as immediately overtly interested in science or policy. It's more about the lived experience of climate change and conveying that to a broader reading public. Um, each chapter opens with what I call a testimony, a section that's written in the voice of one of the town's residents about sort of the thing, the event that woke them up to their vulnerability and what they decided to do with that information. And so there are two, there are two chapters in the book that deal with managed retreat. One on the eldest Jean Charles, who we were just chatting about in the in the pregame over here in our Zoom pregame. And the other one um, has to do with Oakwood Beach and Staten Island. So I'm going to read the testimony that starts off the, a portion of the testimony that starts off the Oakwood Beach chapter. The only other thing that I want to mention is that um, I had been reading and writing about, Oak, I had been researching in Oakwood Beach, spending time in that community for over a year before I heard this story. And that's something that, you know, I'd be happy to talk about maybe in our panel discussion a little bit later. Um, what it means to become sort of invested in a community and have a reciprocal relationship with the people um, whose stories you work on behalf of. Um, so this is the testimony of Nicole Montalto. She's describing um, Hurricane Sandy. And I, you know, the storm came ashore the night before. She fled her house, her father stayed behind, and now she's looking for him, it's the next day and she can't find him anywhere. So this is Nicole Montalto's voice. I went into my house, I was screaming for my dad, everything was upside down. The couches floated to different areas, my bed was up on the wall. The only things that didn't move were my dining room table and the filing cabinet because both were too heavy. That's where my dog took sanctuary on my filing cabinet. My cat was sitting there on top of my bed I didn't see my dad. I thought, shit, maybe he left. Maybe he went to someone's house. But then I thought, he wouldn't leave the animals. My dad's wallet was still in his room. There was something else, too, that he left behind. I don't remember what it was. The wallet, that was the biggest thing. It had his money and his ID. He wouldn't have left the house without those things. Oh, I know what it was. He was on and off with smoking cigarettes. I'm the same way too. And he had left his pack at the table with a cup and a couple butts that we never smoked in the house. It's so weird to timeline things. I spoke with him on the phone. He said it was good I got out when I did, that the water was rushing in. He was on the basement stairs when he was on the phone with me. Did he come back up and smoke two cigarettes? Was that before or after? I saw these things that were cluing me into the idea that he never left the house. And when I started seeing those things, I went down to the basement and began screaming. I was hoping that I would hear him, but at the same time, I wasn't. My dad's friends, once they knew he was missing, they broke all the windows in the basement to get the water out. They started pumping the water too. People say he was down there for the pump, but I don't see how it could have been the pump because the basement was already flooded. What the hell could a pump do? When we pulled up on Wednesday morning, my father's friend told us that they'd found him. My father was in my sister's room in the basement. It's tough to see this neighborhood that I grew up in, that my father grew up in, that my sisters grew up in. I mean, we spent our entire lives there being demolished. But on the other side, it's nice knowing that this is to protect everyone else and that it can't happen again. At least it can't happen to the people I know and the people I love. And maybe the government really will do the right thing and let Oakwood go back to nature. After the storm, we were all like, we're moving to a hill. And I moved to a hill. I was 26. I lived through two major floods, one of which took my father's life. Home was that house. It was my dad. It was my mom. It was my sisters. When my dad was gone, 
it wasn't home anymore. So maybe I'll just stop there um, and say, you know, the last thing I'll add is that this, this, there's so much that Nicole says here that is stuff that I have heard in communities all around the country as they struggle with what managed retreat means. Um, and also how important it is to think about um, the afterlife of these places and what it means to step away from places that we call home. Um, how important a sense of justice is in that process. Like a lot of folks in Staten Island would say to me, like, if you're just going to develop this or turn this into a high rise building, like we're not leaving, we'll rot here, we'll die here, we don't care. Um, we want it to create a sense of security for surrounding communities in the years to come. Um, we want this to be part of nature reclaiming this space. And so, you know, you know, there's a lot in Nicole's story that's really important and a lot about her story that taught me how to write Rising. But, you know, when, when I also think about managed retreat and what it means, I think this call to justice, like we collectively want to be part of something bigger than what any one of us can be alone. And that has to be about sort of the transformation of management patterns as they relate to who gets to live along the coast and how and why and who it's accessible to. I think that that's also something that's really, really important when we think about the storytelling that we do around managed retreat. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there. And I'm excited to hear from other folks in the panel and excited for our conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was really an excellent excerpt. Um, Let's see uh, if we can get Julie back on. Maybe we'll do Julie's photographs. Um, All right. Excellent. I'm going to give a little intro to you, Julie, and then I'll I'll share my screen as well, and we can look at some a selection a selection of your photographs. Um, but Julie Dermansky is a, a photojournalist and a multimedia reporter based in New Orleans or in the New Orleans area, who has extensively documented climate change and environmental issues along the Gulf Coast for the last decade, uh, including dozens of different photo essays published since 2013 at DSmog, an independent environmental news site. Many of these photo essays have shared the story of the community on Ile de Jean Charles, where the United States' first official managed retreat from sea level rise is unfolding. Uh, and Dermansky is also a affiliate scholar at Rutgers University Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights. Uh, and her photographs have been published by The Atlantic, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, The Times of London, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and many more places. Um, so we're gonna take a look at some of your work now. Let me share my screen. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, is, that well, visible, is that visible to you? Yeah, it definitely is. So I'm starting with the newest work first, um, because like, um, when people ask Prince, the musician, while well, he was still with us, what he was listening to, it's always his new stuff. So <laughs> there we go. So this is um, the Dolphin Marine Institute in, in Gulfport, and this is the head of it. And uh, the, the latest report that I did, which was published yesterday, is about a part of what the government is doing to protect us uh, to so we won't have to do managed retreat or that we stay safe during it. And that is something that I'm sure you in the New York area are kind of scared of in a way too, because a lot of things are put on hold now. But anyway, this particular project is going to pretty much kill all of the dolphins in the same area that BP impacted them. Um, so if you're interested in, in that, you can, I think I had that on uh, a computer screen. But Oh, it, that one's going to be on desmog, so you can just go there. So that's the first one, and we'll go to the next one. And if I didn't finish finish that thought there, it's that that project ultimately is supposed to build land to save that area, and it really is not going to, in my view and many people's views, but the voices, the scientists, and the people that are putting that information out there are all being silenced by the machine of public relations from the state CPRA. So it's, it's something to really follow and pay attention to because we're told things like, we're using the best available science on stuff for projections that are 50 years out and climate science as we, we all know is new. 
and it's happening now and we don't know and every study every year something is worse so what we're looking at here is um, water management that's been around for quite some time on the Mississippi River and how when the waters of the Mississippi get really high they open the spillway which then goes to the area where the dolphins are getting killed uh, so this is just north of New Orleans and there you can see some petrochemical plants behind uh, at the high river. And it also shows the fragility of everywhere uh, on the coastal communities. They have these looming toxic um, issues of factories and whatnot uh, that are impacted at the same time coastal communities are and have a tendency to spread pollution and other dangers. Next. Okay, and this, uh, Brief here, this is what protects New Orleans. So <laughs> these are antiquated uh, flood control measures. This is from the sewer and water board. And when, so now when you get just a regular rainstorm, you can get your house flooded, your car ruined. Half the time, uh, most of the power sources are off, offline before the storms even hit. Next. Uh, and this is a recent image of the mouth of uh, the Atchafalaya Basin, just to give a, a look of what um, coastal erosion looks like. You hear about it a lot, so that's what it looks like. <laughs> Next. Um, okay, last year we had three back-to-back -back storms. So we had Laura, uh, Delta, and Zeta. Um, this could be damaged from Laura or from Delta, I can't say for sure, but this is um, near Cameron where uh, Laura came up ashore about at a Hurricane 5 strength. And this is downtown Lake Charles. This is kind of, for me, the symbol of the storm, this um, beautiful glass window high rise and the glass was scattered all, all about the next. And uh, one of the houses um, that was hit by both storms because Delta and um, Laura hit uh, Creole and, and uh, Cameron, Cameron, the city of Cameron. A lot of, very few houses are left standing there now. Next. I'm, this is Zeta, this is um, just, you know, another <laughs> another image, but it just shows uh, the kind of damage that gets left behind that would be a, sh a shrimp boat. And so a lot of the people are shrimpers and then they lose their livelihood. Next. Um, then this is uh, what's left of the El de Jean Charles. This is from a few years ago, so some more might have eroded by then, likely. Uh, but you see the road coming out. Um, that road has been rebuilt over and over again. And now my photos are out of date because there are big rock piles alongside the road. Next. Um, and this, um, that's someone from the island, uh, Edison Dardar, who's one of the people that won't take the settlement or still hasn't taken the settlement. Uh, though he evacuated, or he said he will evacuate after this one. This was the last storm. This was Barry. It wasn't even a numbered storm when it flooded the island. Uh, it barely made the news. Um, but uh, a 12-foot storm surge uh, went over the island, and he was uh, evac by a helicopter. Uh, so I was there when he and his wife uh, returned to their home, where they're still living. Next. Uh, now, this one I put in here, this is kind of a very, you could see this scene anywhere now where we have flooding. This is from the thousand year flood in 2016 in, uh, that didn't even have a name. That's why I put this picture in. We have rain events now that don't have names that wreck countless lives. Um, and this scene here, this kind of development is spreading all over in coastal areas in Louisiana, uh, despite uh, all the warnings of um, sea level rise ar around me. Uh, they're ripping up trees. Um, construction is everywhere, gangbusters. And I'm outside of New Orleans in St. Tammany Parish. Next. Um, I had to throw a cat, cat in the slideshow because everything I say is uh, so negative. So 
This is Hector Isaac. This is in Plaquemines Parish in an area outside of um, uh, any kind of sea level, um, I'm sorry, water control protection. Next. And um, now I'm jumping over quickly to Texas, kind of toward the end here. This is from Harvey. And the reason I bring this slide in, this is an area that isn't in a flood zone and was flooded to counter measurements because um, a dam was gonna bust, so they had to let water out. So a community where people didn't have flood insurance because it wasn't required was still completely impacted by water. So it's all connected. And that's part of why managed retreat, I think is so tricky. It's because a lot of the infrastructure that we're relying on isn't um, ready for the kind of extreme weather that we're getting. Next. And this is kind of like a typical scene that is playing out all over the country when you have mass storms. This was um, in Viter, Texas, which got hit days after um, Harvey because of backflow of water. So often when the rain event is over, uh, you're not out of the water because the water moves. And this was um, uh, just a, a parking lot where they were getting people out as fast as they could because the water was still rising days after the rain event. Next. And um, this, okay, is not a storm, but it goes into the other kind of coverage I do. This is um, in Cancer Alley in Reserve, Louisiana, um, which is very close to the Mississippi River. Uh, but just to show the proximity to communities and infrastructure and all in Cancer Alley now, we're looking at building more petrochemical plants that are impacting the environmental justice fence line communities. It's mostly black people who are getting hit with the poisons which um, are being put in the atmosphere uh, that are driving the climate crisis that impacts them. Uh, okay, and next one. And this is um, going back to, since we're coming to the end, this is right on our coast where um, this was still standing though. It's being constructed when Laura and Delta hit. It's a new big LNG plant. And while we talk about managed retreat, we shouldn't forget that the government is continuing to permit huge export facilities and all of the infrastructure needed to make it. So whatever gains we seem to make and whatever positive things that are going on that people celebrate, like stopping the northern route of the Keystone XL pipeline, people quickly forget that the fast track, uh, the southern route of that pipeline was fast tracked and Trans Canada, which also changed its name, just like the pipeline changed its name. The pipeline is the southern route. Um, so we don't even realize that the southern route was built. Uh, TransCanada, which is now TC Energy, they're moving their tar sands from Canada to the Gulf Coast to export facilities like this um, that you know we all know are going to be underwater at a, at a certain point, and yet these things are being permitted and helping make things worse as we plan for managed retreat. That's a mouthful, huh? Next. <laughs> And then I had to bring in Sandy too. Um, this is a kind of ending on a light, but not light at all note. I'm from New Jersey and I keep hard drives of all my archival material in Louisiana and in New Jersey. So you tell me, I, maybe I've got to find another place. <laughs> Next, I think that's it though. Okay. So I don't know if I, I used up my time or not, but that was my plan to go quick and that should do it. Thank you, that was excellent. Thank you for sharing some of your photographs. That photo of the LNG tank, I couldn't help but notice that tiny little wall around the very edge that is meant to keep out the, keep out the rising seas, I guess. But we'll see what happens when it floods in there like a bowl. Um, so next we have Josephine Holtzman and Isaac Kestenbaum. Let's see if we can get Isaac to restart his video. Isaac, excellent. Here I am. Um, it might just be Isaac uh, temporarily uh, speaking with us, um, but uh, I'm going to give an introduction for both Josephine and Isaac. Uh, 
uh, Josie and Isaac are audio producers and documentary storytellers who are currently based in Maine. They're the co-founders of Future Projects, which has produced a series of award-winning podcasts and radio programs and immersive audio projects and interactive audio tours for NPR, Vox, The Guardian, The Nature Conservancy, The Sierra Club. Uh, and much of their work is focused on using audio to tell stories about climate change, especially in rural and native communities in Alaska. Their projects include the best-selling true crime podcast, Midnight Sun, which I think was from 2019 with writer James Domic Jr. and Frontier of Change uh, from 2016, which shared stories from Alaskans whose lives are being impacted by climate change uh, through podcasts, events, movies, and audio tours. And Winter's Past, which was an immersive multimedia storytelling project about the disappearance of the season of winter in New England and Alaska. Their work has received a Peabody Award, a DuPont Award, and Isaac is also uh, the, currently the director of the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies at the Maine College of Art. And I will turn it over to Josie and Isaac. Hi, um, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Nathan. Um, I. Uh, just for, first, I wanted to say that, uh, so Josie, um, I think, uh, Elizabeth, you said that last year, uh, you know, you had a kid, so you were unable to attend. So we also just had a kid. Uh, Josie and I are also married as well as working together. And uh, Josie had to run downstairs to attend to him. So his timing uh, could be a little better. Um, but Josie wishes she could be here and she apologizes that she had was called away on other business. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, is just share a little bit of our work. Um, in terms of, a, in the form of a, a, an audio excerpt from one of our pieces, but just first a little bit of context. Um, you know, as Nathan said, we both work in audio, but um, we also really like to produce sort of uh, multimedia, like experiential things, including a form called a sound walk, which is essentially like an audio tour meant to be heard outside while walking. Um, so for this project called Frontier of Change, uh, Josie and I spent in about a year in Alaska, we were based in Anchorage and we we're working with a uh, radio station there called KNBA, which is kind of uh, the Alaska native station. Um, it's the largest native station to broadcast in an urban environment, I believe, in the country. Um, and uh, so we worked with them to uh, produce this big project about climate change called uh, Frontier of Change. And sort of the, uh, the key, uh, the uh, like, Capstone or the, the the crown jewel of these was uh, um, these audio walks called uh, audio tours called sound walks and um, I'm going to play you an excerpt from one of these but just to give you a little bit more context we presented these uh, in partnership with the Anchorage Museum um, and we kind of sold tickets as if it were a sort of virtual reality um, travel agency so you would go to the museum you get your ticket for this tour and then you would walk a mile through downtown Anchorage. Um, but while you're walking through downtown Anchorage, your ears would be transported you know, to a more rural part of Alaska that was experiencing climate change um, really firsthand. Um, so this excerpt is from an audio tour, a sound walk that transported listeners to the village of Shaktulik, which is probably like a hundred miles from Anchorage. It's on the, um, the north, west coast um, and it is uh, it's right on the ocean and um, it's already been relocated twice and they'll likely have to move again but uh, there's this real tension in the village um, I think still today between you know kind of uh, sheltering in place and trying to fortify where they live versus moving um, and a lot of what you'll hear um, mentions this and also they were trying to uh, they built a big berm uh, as like a seawall in the village that's meant to um, protect them from these really intense fall storms, which are getting um, kind of worse and with no sea ice to protect the village. Uh, they kind of bear the full brunt of these storms. Um, so I think that's enough context. You would, you know, you would have heard this while you're walking through downtown Anchorage. And the idea with the sound walk is that you're kind of being confronted and, and made to feel something in a way um, that we hope kind of makes you understand it on like a, a visceral emotional level um, rather than just sort of intellectually understanding something. Um, so I'm going to share, it's about three minutes. Um, it's kind of excerpt from the 
beginning middle-ish of the walk, it would have been about a half hour walk total, um, but this is like three or four minutes. So, There's roughly about 61 houses in the community. Uh, some of our neighbors around uh, call it Skittleville sometimes. If you look at the color of the houses, our community does look like a bag of Skittles. Maybe 450 to 500 feet wide from the river to, to the ocean. And on the ocean side, we have under 200 feet of up to the water. So we've lost 60 to 75 feet of surface. Come on in. It's so scary, too scary to live here in Shaktulik because we have virtually no way of escape at all because in the ocean side we just have the oceans the high waters the rough waters in the back we have the Shaktulik river when both of them rise, rise at the same time we just have on, only a very narrow strip of land to walk on otherwise we're we're stuck. 20 years from now, this place would probably be underwater. That's what really, really concerns me. Eugene knows I, I'm, it's in me, in my heart. I push him. I push him to help move us. Move while we can, while we have the time. Yeah. My wife and I, we got married in September and 74, October, November was probably one of the first times that we started experiencing no frozen, solid frozen ice in the ocean. The waves pounded against the village and it was just a solid wall of frozen slush, the whole front of the village. We opened the door and there was uh, frozen snow and driftwood out in the yard and basically right up to the porch door. Relocation has been talked about a lot. Evacuations, uh, evacuation road, evacuation shelter, but those are very costly. You could call this berm a beaver dam. It's nothing sophisticated. Basically give the waves a little bit more to lap on and give, you know, some elevation. Some call it a band-aid. I'm not saying it's going to protect or save us, but I think it will give us time. I'm not a scientist, but I've lived this long on common sense. Um, so yeah, the um, the walk would uh, kind of continue on, um, you know, from there, and uh, it, uh, you kind of meet other people in the village. Uh, and that, by the way, the, the main voice you heard was the mayor of Shaktul, uh, Eugene Sixty. Um, I think that kind of wraps up um, what what I wanted to share from from both of us. Great, thank you so much, Isaac, for sharing that. Um... So I think we're going to get right into uh, a discussion amongst all of us. So if you guys would all love to turn on your video and unmute yourselves, we will, we will converse. Um, you know, one question I had that was sort of for all the panelists was about um, how, you came, how you came to really be passionate about the subject of sea level rise, climate change. You know, you've, you've been working in the field for many, many years. Uh, engaging with these issues, but how, you know what what has driven that? Like, what? How did you first become involved in wanting to tell stories around sea level rise or climate change, and and what has sort of sustained that work for for such a long period of time? 
I can take a stab at that. Yeah. I came uh, to New Orleans um, a year after Katrina, just a little bit less. And I, I mean, I knew the city well because I'd gone to school there. And I was working on something about natural history. And I gave myself a tour of the damage from Katrina. And I was personally embarrassed. I had no concept of the magnitude of what had happened. And at that time, I had was living like in a rent control place in Santa Monica. And I moved here because uh, it's 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 the story of our times, and uh, I got hooked. That was it. <laughs> so, you know, then then you you realize how everything's connected to commerce and the Mississippi River, and uh, you know there are a lot of places being impacted now. Uh, but for me, everything comes together here because we're not only the front line of the destruction and everything, but we're the front line of the people who are causing climate change. Yeah. Yeah, definitely true. And I, and your photos show that really well, the sort of contrast between destruction and then the petrochemical industry and right there next to each other in the wetlands. Um, the other panelists, you want to you wanna jump into, into uh, why you got involved in these issues? Sure. <laughs> Let me unmute myself. <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, I in many ways, like I trained as a poet originally, and I uh, spent a lot of time living in Oregon. And I had, I think, an idea that I wanted to be an environmental writer in some way, shape, or form. And then it became, you know, I think half of the people in the state of Oregon also want to be environmental writers. Um, but for me, I, I did, I was sent to report a story in 2011 on the India-Bangladesh border fence, which is the longest border fence in the world. It was completed that year. It's kind of like the US-Mexico border um, and that you have this sort of superpower putting up uh, physical barriers to migration, in inward migration from a lower income, uh, country that's you know got a complicated history. Anyways, I don't need to go into that. that deeply but what i'll say is that in bangladesh a lot of people told me you know the fence isn't the problem the fact that the there's salt water in the aquifer now is our problem um and for me that was just like an absolute life-changing moment where i thought oh sea level rise and climate change isn't a problem of the future it's really with us now and it's also exacerbated sort of like what Julie's talking about by human interventions in the in the environment. So, you know, similar in some ways to the Mississippi River Delta, um, the Ganges River has been horribly mismanaged and India now diverts over 50% of its flow um, to do upstream irrigation projects, which means that less fresh water is making it to the uh, to the river mouth, which means that the aquifer is dropping and you get salt water working its way in. So I started to see these ways in which like climate change is with us in the present tense and is also, you know, directly and indirectly exacerbated by human interventions in the environment. And I kind of was like, oh, this is how I marry my passion for environmental writing to the story of our time. Um, and so I went back to the United States and I thought if it's happening in Bangladesh, it's happening here too. We always sort of talk about it as like an over there problem. This was a decade ago, over a decade ago. Um, and I started searching out the places in the US where it was a reality in the present tense and they, you know, throw a stone and you hit one. So um, I think the thing that keeps me going is listening to people's stories and thinking about the ways in which um, we can start to reframe climate change, not just as a threat multiplier, but an opportunity multiplier and hearing in really particular ways about how, especially in sort of communities that haven't necessarily been in charge of the narrative that gets told about them, um, how it is opening opportunities for collective collaboration that demanding a kind of collective collaboration in some of these places. Um, that to me is deeply inspiring, though I also think that often when that collaborative spirit is 
you know, intercepted through different um, bureaucratic state run apparatuses that it can get uh, you know, blunted really quickly. You see that with the Isle de Jean Charles, you see this like real groundwork that individuals in communities put, put into trying to take control of the narrative of their community and arrive at a more just future. And, you know, I think that we don't have the right avenues open yet for that transition to work in as many places as it's gonna have to work in the future. But I do think there are opportunities there. And I think that's part of what keeps me really excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I think- yeah, it's like a lot of what both of you have already said definitely resonates with me. Um, I think, you know, on a personal level, I, I initially never wanted to do anything about climate change because I find it so kind of overwhelming and terrifying. Um, but then I think for both of us, we just felt like, well, you know, to kind of creatively engage with it is a way to reckon with it personally. Um, so I think that's kind of like why personally I was drawn to it as a storyteller and as an artist and a journalist. Um, but then I think similarly to the other panelists, like once we started reporting on it, it, it is the story, you know, of, it is the story. <laughs> that's the only story I think that's happening right now. Um, and I think uh, it, it still feels important. It still feels like there are, you know, voices that aren't being heard or that are not kind of given control. I like the way you put that, Elizabeth, you know, of their own narratives. And I feel like in all of our work, Josie and I really try to recede to the background as much as possible and kind of let other voices sort of take take the reins uh, as it were. Um, so that's what drew us to it. And I think, you know, what, similarly, I think to what uh, Elizabeth said is, you know, what we're interested in now, I think is um, like, what's the next, what's the next phase of, of climate storytelling, climate reporting going to be and I think like a lot of the tricks that we've used so far need to be reimagined. I don't know, I feel like everyone's just trying to scare everybody and, and I don't know how, I think it's worked a lot. I think that's, that's certainly helped get us to where we are now. And I'm just really interested in like what the, what the next 10 years of climate coverage is gonna look like. Um, and I don't, I'm not gonna like right now say that I have like <laughs> the answer to that, but like, I think personally, you know, I'm interested, I think, in stories of opportunity, stories of resilience, and kind of trying to find, I guess, personally, again, kind of like the wonder and the awe and sort of the beauty and like what the current moment that we're in. Yeah, Nathan, I forgot to say what, what sustains me. I guess I get so lost in, in my thoughts, but it's coming back to you because I report on this negative stuff, but I, I focus on, in my writing, the people who are fighting back or who are exposing issues that no one's reporting on. And that's where I get my energy to go on. I mean, you know, you talk to a dolphin specialist who shows all the holes in the project, someone's gotta tell a story. And, you know, I cover all the people in Cancer Alley who are fighting against these petrochemical plants coming in. And that impacts all of us, their fight, if they can stop one plant, it's that much less bad stuff. So that's what sustains me. Sorry, I just had to get that in there because I get lost in the negative. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that's something I've been hearing at some of the other panels today too. Is just you know how do we overcome climate fatigue and um, keep going with 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 these really difficult issues around sea level rise, around retreat. I mean, managed retreat is a very difficult emotional issue to be focusing on. That that's sort of one of my questions for all the panels panelists as well. But maybe I'll start with with Isaac. Um, you know, uh, for all the panelists, you're going to these communities and you're, uh, in many cases, working collaboratively with them to help amplify their stories. Maybe you can talk a little about that process. Like, what is it like for you to go into a community that's dealing with the trauma of a disaster or relocation or retreat and and to try and talk with them and, and gain their, in some cases, I'm sure gaining their trust, but then working with them to help highlight their stories. Um, maybe you can discuss that a little. Yeah, um, I think, you know, it's, it's something that we always really try to be sensitive to with all of our storytelling is not, I mean, I think like journalism and storytelling, there's always a little bit of discomfort, I think, no matter how responsible you are, because you are kind of extracting a story in, in some form, but I think there's ways that you can do it in a way that's feels very responsible and collaborative. Um, so, 
you know, I think from the get go, you know, we knew that we were outsiders and we really wanted to work with insiders to sort of tell the story collaboratively. So that's why we kind of conceived this project with um, the, the Frontier Change project that we did with these stories from Alaska about, um, you know, we, we pitched it as a collaboration with KNBA, which is like the Alaska native radio station. And we worked very closely with the, the editor there to, you know, to tell these stories. Um, and then I think, you know, it would be, it's interesting, like some of the communities we would call up, um, they'd be like, oh yeah, like Al Jazeera was just here, you know, a week ago and BBC was here like two weeks ago. And so you're, you're at what to you feels like, or what to, to me anyway, felt like kind of the end of the earth. But at the same time, it's a very crowded place with like lots of journalists wanting to come in and like get the picture of the, you know, the house falling into the ocean or, you know, what have you. Um, so we really tried to um, get like introductions into the community and just like arrive there out of nowhere, you know, kind of be introduced, like make a contact locally, someone who um, could kind of help us collaboratively tell this story almost as like a partner and then have that person introduce, introduce us to other people. Um, so I think, you know, that in that way, like uh, our connections at KNBA, the radio station were really helpful to sort of, yeah, the introduction makes you feel like an insider. And then I think, you know, obviously just being very clear about like what the final product is going to be. And then, um, you know, giving something back, you know, I think we would give people copies of their, of their raw, like the raw interview if they, if they wanted it. And of course, sending them the final piece when it was done. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then I guess the only other thing is just sort of doing your research to know like what the customs are, or, you know, um, in, in, the, in the places you're visiting. And um, uh, I think that uh, that went a long way because it's, it's sort of like customer like show up with some gift from somewhere, um, especially in, in these rural communities in Alaska are not reachable by car. And, you know, you have to take kind of two or three planes to get to these places. So if you go to the, the store, uh, there's like almost no fresh fruit. So like customarily we like kind of fill up a tub of just like uh, a tote with just like oranges and clementines and lemons and kind of just bring something to people. And that was, uh, it's kind of like the custom, but um, I think it went a long way to showing that we kind of understood who we were and where we were coming from and where we're going. Yeah, that's a, something also I think Elizabeth, we had talked a little about too, just that idea of not doing extractive storytelling, but more collaborative. How do you go into these communities and, and speak with people about, you know, the death of a family member or the loss of their family home or, um, you know, it, I think that's a super important question and my brain and heart go like 10 different places at once to, you know, lessons I've learned along the way. Where do I want to start? Um, you know, I mentioned a little bit in the intro to Nicole's testimony, like she, I heard that story after I'd been there on and off for a year. So like time, just thinking about, you know, what it means to be around for longer um, and prioritizing that if possible. I also, almost every community that I work in, I try to like enter it, I think of it in as vulnerable a way as possible. So like I would do, I would always ride my bike out to Oakwood Beach. Um, I often, you know, walk around as opposed to like drive a rental car. If I'm, you know, I might park outside the community and walk in and go door to door. So I think there's a sense of like building trust through creating a little bit of physical vulnerability, like not having this, you know, boxy rental car around me or whatever. Um, totally what Isaac is talking about, that sense of getting a partner in the community, bringing gifts into the community. And then, you know, like once, once I start like recording interviews and stuff and focusing in on a single voice or a couple of voices and doing these testimonies, I, you know, 95% of what Nicole told me that day is edited out of the testimony. And I then, you know, as a storyteller, I'm trying to like create this from her voice, a, a, an arc and a, a distinct storyline so that the reader can follow it. 
Um, and I involved her in the process. Like I would do an edit and I would send it to her and ask her what she thought and say like, hey, if you want anything change, change something. Um, I did that. I can still remember um, Chris Brunet out on the Isle de Jean Charles, you know, his testimony had a line in it that said, uh, it's not throwing me into any big city confusion, uh, this choice about whether or not to retreat. And when I asked him, you know, what do you want to change here? He was like, well, could you cut out that line? Cause there are no big cities around here. And I don't want people to think that there's big cities around here. And I was like, no one's gonna think that like it's just a great line it sounds just like you like for me it was his voice and he was like no I really don't want it in there and I was like okay you know so like having a little bit having it not just be like a one-time interview and then it appears somewhere else um after you've massaged it or edited it but like getting people's contact information and involving them in that editing process I think is pretty important um and then the last thing I'll say is like, totally thinking about the give back to a community and also being pretty clear about what you can't do. Like, I think there's also a sense of like, oh, now that our story's heard, something's gonna change. And I more and more try to be really upfront and say like, you know, I can't promise any specific change is gonna come from this. I don't want you to get your expectations up. Um, I don't think I did that in the beginning. And I think it creates a little bit of a false sense of hope. Um, the, so like, no, and I think I got frustrated with that too, right? Like as a storyteller, I'm like, I want this story to change the world and it totally doesn't. And then you're like, oh, you know, I'm in the pit, the, like the pit of despair. I've spent my whole life work on this and I don't see it creating the immediate change that I'd like it to. Um, so I've been thinking about like other kinds of ways to generate that change. I feel like I've been talking for a really long time, so I'm going to stop. But like maybe that's something that we can circle back to as we keep talking is like, how do we think about what we want these stories to do? Um, but I'm going to pass the mic because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> yeah, Julie, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, you're you're there like you know not every day necessarily but you're there like for years and years on the coast of Louisiana um visiting these these same communities telling these stories you know over the course of a, a really long period of time and I'm sure you must see a lot of other journalists just come in and you know come in for a, a day like heli helicopter journalism I think it's called but come in try and get that one photo up and then take off like what what is it like for you though to be working in these places uh, for, for so long funny too because I didn't put any pictures of the people and the community bonds I think it's um my mind was so somewhere else and sometimes just showing the destruction for me gets the point across about how the fragility but the relationships uh, like with the Ile de Jean Charles I started going there in 2009 um so the people like I mean I give the tribe the, my photos for their website. I, you know, I help them all the time. If anything, if you want to get in touch with uh, Chief Nakin, uh, no, he doesn't respond to emails or calls. He's so sick of the media. So what happens is people Google it, they find my work, and everyone asks me how to get in touch with him. And I humor some people, but I mostly, I mostly humor the chief because then I, I vet the people for him and he just laughs, you know, he just thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. And occasionally I give people his home address. I'm like, just, especially during COVID, I'm just like, just go there, he's home, you know, if I, if I feel that they're real good journalists. And so I've become like the gatekeeper for some communities, including Cancer Alley. Um, it's in the news all the time now, but I started co covering it in 2016 and, um, I basically, some of the community members, I have them text me if they're worried about someone coming to them because they're, they're really not good with Google and stuff like that. And I want to make sure since they're fighting industry that to protect them from people, I'll just throw like Breitbart or something who will come in their house and record stuff and make them look bad or whatever. And I, I just check for them. So they know they can count on me for that. It doesn't take too much out of my day. Uh, so I do that because they're everyone's going to Cancer Alley now. But I, I bring like like Isaac said, I bring gifts and that's just my nature. I didn't even know that was an indigenous uh, practice before you even 
get involved with them to show up with a gift. Um, but, you know, I generally drive places because I like to bring all my gear with me. So I have everything. So when I cover disaster or whatever, I have first aid. I give it, I mean, I just help people everywhere I am. And apparently that's not really what journalists generally do. But um, my background is I'm a fine artist. I have a degree in ceramics and sculpture. And uh, at a certain point after a couple of decades of working with tactile things and making stuff, I just closed up my shop, got camera gear and started shooting. So when I approach a story, even though um, you know some people don't even know I shoot now, they just see me as a writer, um, it's a painting for me or a sculpture. It's the same. So maybe, well, with photo, I get a few assignments here and there. Writing, generally, I just choose my own story. So I, I write them, work on them till they're done. And so I don't feel like I'm intruding. I mean, maybe I'm intruding, but I, I go in not to, to do a job. I go in because my passion is all in and I want to get a story out. And I think that people respond to that. So um, I don't necessarily get contacts beforehand. A lot of the places that I report on though are places that no one bothers to show up. So there are contacts, uh, but yeah, it is always good. You know, once you're in, in the community you're in uh, and as far as, you know, checking with poets and all that, I'm so careful. And I think that comes from um, being an artist First, not a journalist, not being in the mad rush for the deadline. Oh, gosh, it's great when you publish and you don't have to think about it for that moment. Like it, you kind of open brain space. Um, but, you know, I see sometimes journalists take notes really fast and I can't do that. I can't even read my notes. I mean, these were these were my notes for this. You know, I, I just don't work that way. So um, I record things and transcribe them so I don't mess up because one word changes someone's whole story. Like what, what with Chris, I, I get that all too well. And so once I do a story, generally there's like word of mouth, people trust me. And though Smog, where most of my work is published, isn't that well known. Um, I just stick around, I've been here for a while. So uh, people who are kind of following these things know they can trust me. So that's how my approach is just to get it right, get it right. <laughs> that's key too. Yeah, I think you touch on something though that's really great about just, you know, one of the reasons I want to convene this panel is that all of your work is not coming at this from like the traditional journalistic sense. You know, you have uh, you have a background as a fine artist. Elizabeth has a background in poetry. Isaac and, and Josephine have eyes, backgrounds as artists. So it's it's really bringing like a different kind of passion to these stories that is maybe more personal or, or more empathetic in some ways. But, um, you know, touching on that, Elizabeth, you know, you, you said you wanted to talk a little about like what what impacts do you want? You know, what what is it that you hope doing this work will will uh impact you know what 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 do you hope from from creating this work you spent i think seven years on your book um what you know without knowing that people might like it even you know what what is the hope there <laughs> uh you know i think in many ways i went into it hoping to I don't know what I went into it hoping to do. I just wanted to like tell these sea level rise stories. And the longer I worked on it, the more I think actually reframing retreat as um, not just defeat as we often think of it sort of in this like military language, but thinking about it as like moving or an opportunity or um, trying to like subtly shift the, the way that we relate to that word, that felt important to me um, as I worked on the project. And then I think, you know, I never, I never expected the book to be a finalist for the Pulitzer. So then there's this like, oh my God, people are reading this book. And that then I think led me to get my expectations in a slightly different place where I was like, okay, so now the book's gonna like really do something. And then I got disappointed because I didn't see that happening. I was like, oh, it can be a book that's read. It can be art that's like interacted with and celebrated and it won't 
create policy change in an immediate sense. So I think I went, you know, I've had a couple polls of expectation around this work and has, is it contributing to like shifting the conversation around retreat? Probably some, but it's like, you know, a book can be celebrated amongst a certain reading public, but that doesn't necessarily translate to creating the policies that will enable people to move in a way that helps them maintain their sense of community. So there's a little bit of like a disconnect there for me. Um, so one of the things that I've been experimenting with recently is um, sort of twofold. Right as the book was being published, a group started to form called, they were initially called Flood Forum USA, then they became Higher Ground, and now they're the Anthropocene Alliance. They've become the single largest network of frontline climate changed communities in the country, and they are primarily communities that are flooding. Um, and, and what the work of the central NGO hub does is they connect those communities with pro bono hydrologists and pro bono um, lawyers to help them create the legal legal battles that will lead to either, you know, the infrastructure solutions being put in place in their community that will help reduce flooding or um, getting communities access to funds for managed retreat. One of the re one of the things that we see with managed retreat, and I'm sure most of you policy folks out there know this, is like, ah. Uh, the communities that tend to get money for managed retreat are lower income communities and higher pockets of wealth. So you have to have um, an area that's wealthy enough to hire a civil servant of some kind, to have a floodplain manager of some kind who's gonna navigate the bureaucratic red tape that, that surrounds disaster funding um, and get the funding allocated to these communities. So we know that that's a huge barrier to getting bought out is if you live in a community that's poor enough not to have sort of that access point, that civil servant who can do the legwork, the legal legwork on your behalf. So what Anthropocene Alliance does is they start to empower communities to do some of that work on their own with the help of these um, pro bono hydrologists and lawyers. So one of the things I've started experimenting with is like teaching writing workshops for that network of people to help them write op-eds in their local papers. Um, I now donate 5% of all my speaking fees to Anthropocene Alliance specifically to support projects, communities that are interested in managed retreat. And I got the really good news recently that one of the communities that I've been working to support or that I shouldn't even say, I've been working to support that rising supports, right? Like this book has some commercial success. I'm trying to like put that back into the communities that need it. Um, and I just found out that one of the communities that like for the past year, I've been like funding the rental space for their community meetings, got um, a grant of 15, $15 million to get bought out. So, you know, that feels like change that feels tangible and also is sort of like ground up like they're getting money for what they want to do not what someone's telling them they have to do ah uh, so that's my like new way of answering that question and i'm sure it'll continue to change but i think you know that's a really important question to ask like what do we want to do with this work yeah yeah i mean that's a question i could ask to you isaac as well like you know, your sound walks and your audio pieces are not meant to solve sea level rise and climate change. They're not meant to give an answer about whether managed retreat is a feasible solution, but they evoke something much different. And maybe you could talk a little about that. Like what, what do you hope to evoke with these, these pieces? Yeah. You know, um, it's something that like, is always tough for me to think about because you know, we're not, like you said, like we don't work in policy. We don't really have our, it's it's a doing journalism and storytelling and, and art is like a sort of strange way to like make an impact. But, you know, I do think it does make one, but usually in our work, we kind of think about the the listener. And I think the goal with the audio tours, which I think I, I mentioned to earlier is to kind of, 
hit you in the gut and make you understand something in, on an emotional level rather than an intellectual level um, and to kind of make you feel something. And especially, you know, one of our earlier pieces that Josie and I did together was this project called uh, Winter's Past. And again, it was audio tours and they're meant to be heard outside during winter and they're, they're site specific. So you'd walk along like a river that used to freeze over enough that they would like race ice yachts on this river or like a pond that used to be have an ice harvest. And the thinking was you would hear these pieces outside during the winter time when what would likely be like a more mild winter than the winter you were hearing about through these stories. And you'd kind of experience this like visceral sense of like dissonance. And then you would kind of understand in a way that you wouldn't otherwise um, uh, what was really happening in the world because you would feel something, maybe physically, you'd feel warmer than you think you should feel. Um, so I think the goal with that work is just like make people understand something on a real emotional level. Um, and I think, you know, I think similar to, to what, um, you know, other people have said is uh, we also kind of did other things kind of behind the scenes or um, in other ways to feel like we were having an impact. Like we did storytelling workshops when we were in Alaska with the Arctic youth ambassadors to like kind of help them kind of refine the way they tell their stories. And we like mailed uh, audio recorders to them and like help them produce things. So I think we've done other things that uh, I sort of like felt us like as far as we'd want to go in terms of uh, like advocacy. Cause I think also I've talked a lot about being an artist, but also I think there is something to being like a journalist and, and, and maintaining some level of like, not neutrality, but I don't know. I don't know what the, what the right word is, but I think there's like, there's like, you do have some, as like a somewhat outsider, I think you have a certain power or um, uh, uh, prestige or I'm not thinking the right word. There's some word I think that there is some you, a power you have as like an outsider who's not like clearly an advocate for, for something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's these ethical questions about telling these stories. And then I do, I do feel though, it's sort of like, you know, having a, looking at these through like a more artistic lens, it's almost like you have the freedom to um, say things that, uh, that maybe scientists or, or academics are not free to say. Um, and that might be a question for Julie actually, but you know, it's, it's, it's like you, you have these, this passion for these stories and, and you've been following them for years. Um, because you want to, it's not, it's not because someone's telling you to go tell the story. Um, and you, and you're able to, to, in some ways, you know, say what you want to say, tell the stories you want to tell. And maybe you can talk about that, like talk about. Well, there, there, um, yeah. I have a simple answer that ties back to what, what the you know outcome is. Mine's pretty simple is, um, I hope that my photos and my, um, my multimedia journalists, all the reports I write, that they serve as a record so someone can't say they didn't know. That's that's pretty much yeah. the gist of it. Um, and you know, like um, one woman who I've followed since 2016, she's in the news like all over the place. Um, Sharon Levine, you might have seen pictures of her. I shot those. <laughs> I don't have a credit there. Therefore, the Goldman Prize. She won the Goldman Environmental Prize. And I'd like to think I have a teeny role in that because I've been like all over her story and and shot portraits of her for for Bloomberg for everyone over the years and it was just so cool to see her succeed but you know she's in uh, an African-American community that no one was covering when I started reporting on it and um, as far as like giving back to the community and doing something useful and crossing that line between journalism and uh, I don't I mean I don't take credit for their activism but Oftentimes I'm the only camera there. So not only am I shooting, I'm shooting video. So I'll be at a council meeting that isn't recorded by anybody and I'll have the only record of what's said. And so, you know, I can make some money off of it, which I do. I license stuff to people. Oh, you know, I gotta be creative of how I make my living, uh, but I can give it to the community. If someone needs a transcript, uh, I often, um, I'm like the community's paparazzi. <laughs> That's, they all think I'm there shooting for them so who am I to tell them that I'm not so I don't know if that really answers the the question but you know I do straight reporting for Dsmog. um I use the voices of the people I'm reporting on to make my points I don't put my own in which I think is really cool about 
reporting and not uh, necessarily writing a first person narrative, but it, it is art that way, you know, to weave, weave things in and find the things that get the points across that you're trying. And it's much more satisfying for me as an artist to um, use what's really happening in real time in real life than what I used to do and take everything out of my head and make stuff. Uh, just being out in the world is, is, um, was a good decision for me. I, I don't know exactly what happened <laughs> that did that. But I, you know, I think a, real, a lot of artists, if you're doing poetry before, you change medium. You can't stay comfortable. And that's another thing reporting on climate, you know, but back to the conversation about managed retreat. Um, I'm interested in that conversation, but I can't help but think of it more as managed triage, but maybe that talks, speaks to more where I live. It's just so insane. You know, it's, how can you be ready? What's what's resistance? Uh, a re a resilience. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't have children, so I'm pretty fast on my feet. I have a partner, but you know, I can kind of escape. But you stay somewhere long enough, and I've got five cats. One was in the picture a minute ago. How do you evacuate with five cats? <laughs> anyway, so I don't know if I answered you. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I mean, that that was like a quick question I had for all of you, too, is just, you know, in your work in the field, do you think, do you, do you view managed retreat as being like a viable um, outcome for uh, for these communities that are facing sea level rise or, or, or in, in other places that are facing fires and uh, extreme heat? You know, is, is managed retreat actually something that has been successful uh, in terms of what you've seen? I know that Julie has talked about that a little bit with me and it's it's not necessarily been the most successful in Ile de Jean Charles uh, in Staten Island. I can say that the managed retreat is very complicated. It is not what I would call like a, a simple success story. It is a very complicated story. Um, so yeah, it, it, let's talk about that. Let's, talk, let's bring well, it back yeah, to managed it, retreat for the conference. Yeah. I, I've got to throw throw this out there because it's just on on point with that. Is um, there's something people are talking about with this diversion project I bought out and I won't stay on this long, but people think they're gonna do something and this water is gonna come in, you're gonna take polluted Mississippi fresh water into a saltwater estuary and the dolphins are gonna die. But you know, hey, mitigation, we can move the dolphins. You can't move dolphins. Dolphins are like us. They stay till they die. And that's what for me managed retreat I, I want to hear the rest because I want to hear that it can work and not be so negative, but dolphins will get sick. They'll get lesions. They, they don't move because it's their territory and people don't want them. Other dolphins don't want them in that territory. You can't rehab a dolphin and move it to Florida. It's not going to be welcome there. And I just think a lot of, I don't know, you know, maybe some people are you know managing to retreat, but I'm not feeling it, so I'm gonna pass. <laughs> that I wanted to get out there because we talked about El Deshaun Charles, but I hadn't put it in perspective with you know other species that do the same thing we do. Why do we keep rebuilding? Yeah, yeah, that's something I say a lot is that managed retreat is not just about humans. I mean, there's so many other ecosystems that are going to be that are being destroyed by by sea level rise. Um, so many other species that are going extinct right now, which is something I think that the, the the book Rising definitely does a great job of talking about too. Just the fact that it's it's not just us that is facing this crisis, this this huge calamity. Yeah, I feel like that's in some ways like part of why I came around to managed retreat as being important for us to think about and act on, and you know. I'll say sort of like two things. The first is, you know, what's, if you don't have managed retreat, you have unmanaged retreat. And we have that, right? Like we have millions of people who are refugees from storms that have hit over the past five years in the United States. There are hundreds of thousands of refugees from Hurricane Maria living in the United States who fled Puerto Rico without any help. 
Um, we have the, a ton of refugees fled New Orleans to move to Houston without any help, moved into low income communities and got flooded again by Harvey and had to leave there without any help. So, you know, I think it is emotionally very difficult for us to think about what managed retreat is and what it means to have to move away from places that have defined us. But, you know, the opposite is unmanaged retreat and that's happening and it's usually a lot harder on low income communities who have very few resources to make those transitions. Um, I think, you know, there are definitely species that die in place with sea level rise. And there are also species, you know, I, I think I ended up sort of writing this book from the perspective of wetlands as vulnerable ecosystems and thinking about the vulnerable human communities that are married to those vulnerable ecosystems and recognizing that that vulnerability isn't arrived at by chance, but is structural in most cases. Um, and I think when I look at wetlands communities, you know, historically tidal wetlands in times of non-accelerated sea level rise, like non-human exacerbated sea level rise can move up and down a little bit, can migrate in and out with the rise and fall of sea levels. Um, I think of it as sort of this like desire following the desired, like if you were to sort of zoom out of planet earth and watch it the the wetlands ecosystems like pulse in and out over the last 10,000 years you can see that they can keep pace with rising sea levels or dropping sea levels by the same token we don't know if those ecosystems can keep pace with accelerated sea level rise human accelerated sea level rise um because we've never seen it before but if we know that wetlands ecosystems have at least in certain historical senses, a capacity to adapt through migration, inland migration through their own kind of retreat. The only way to give them a chance to do that is for us to get out of the way. And in a lot of places, we have human infrastructure running along the back end of these tidal ecosystems, especially in places of greater density. And that's another reason, you know, why I think it's important to start thinking about and making avenues towards retreat possible is because we have to get out of the way if we want wetland species to be able to move up and in as well. Otherwise, they kind of drowned in place. If you have a wetlands, you know, it's a really distinct ecosystem. It exists within like a six foot tidal range usually as sea levels rise. If you've got a road along the backside of that, it just kind of gets squeezed between the rising sea and the road and it drowns in place. Um, and we can see that happening all over the country. Again, you can throw a stone and, and check that out especially on the East Coast where we have tons of wetlands, especially in the Gulf Coast where we have tons of wetlands. So, um, you know, I, just, I do think- I just did a piece about that actually uh, in New York City, they're expecting that all of the wetlands are gonna die by 2030 unless they make space for them somehow. And one of the plans for, you know, allowing the wetlands to retreat is that they will take these properties, that these neighborhoods that people are having to retreat from and turn them back into wetlands. Uh, this is like the New York City Parks Department has stated this. They're like, you know, we're going to, as we acquire neighborhoods that are going underwater, we're going to turn them back into wetlands in order to keep the wetlands from going completely extinct, um, which I think is pretty bold for the, a, a city like New York to, to state. They didn't state it that big, but they did say it. Yeah, San Francisco's doing some of that, although they're not doing like land reclamation from human neighborhoods retreating. They have a lot of salt ponds along their shoreline that are like, you know, yeah. remnants from uh, the salt pond era when there was tons of salt extraction in the San Francisco Bay, which makes it easy there. It's like, okay, you got these salt ponds, we're going to turn them into like graded wetlands ecosystems. Uh, um, I'm looking at... I'm looking at our timing here. We're about 10 minutes left and we do have some questions from the audience that I'd love to uh, get to. Uh, one of them actually was related to something that Isaac wanted to talk about as well, actually. But um, uh, the question here, I'll read and then I'll also pose a question to you all. But I, I really, the question is, I really appreciate the reference uh, to new angles of climate coverage. And I'm wondering if there's resistance from mainstream news distributors in accepting more variant 
and less shocking takes on the on climate stories. Um, those stories of resilience or action. And I would say that kind of dovetails with something that Isaac brought up too, but like, you know, what what might be the new ways to tell these stories in the next 10 years? I feel like we're kind of in the early stages of just communicating the basics of like sea level rise exists, climate change exists, you know, the, 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 we've got the initial things that are happening, but I feel like we should be much further along in communicating these stories um, and taking different approaches to these stories. So that's a complicated question, but you know, what, what are these new approaches or these new stories that we might yeah. take on? I mean, I guess like real quick, you know, I don't know if this is indicative of a larger trend, but you know, Josie and I were just uh, kind of commissioned slash invited to pitch a podcast series about climate change. Um, but you know, the, I don't remember exactly how it was put, but it was basically like, you know, this this could on the surface not be about climate change, but it would sort of sneak up on people. Like it actually would be sort of more narrative. You would think you'd be in a narrative, but then at the end you're like, oh wait, like I actually, that was about climate change. So I think um, sort of like a backdoor or like, like not sort of necessarily like this is a 10 part series on climate change. You're gonna listen, you're gonna understand climate change. Climate change, and this is more like, um, you know, what is this? community doing or like what is this like um, person doing like more I think a more narrative based uh, like approach to it is something that I think there's a lot of interest in at least on the podcast side. Um, podcast you're, making, side. you're making me think about something that came up on another panel I was on we were talking about climate fiction but you know how there's this genre of climate fiction and um, the authors on the panel were like, you know, eventually it's, it's not, there will be no climate fiction. It'll just be fiction. It's already creeping into all the fiction. All fiction is going to be writing about it because climate change is, is the reality that is, it is uh, impacting all aspects of our lives. So it's, it's not going to be sort of, you won't have to foreground it. It'll just be yeah. part of the stories. Yeah. There's like this book called Sharks in the Time of Saviors, which is a fiction book, which I don't think would be like on the list of climate fiction. But you know, one of the central things about it is like this native family in Hawaii that kind of returns to the old ways of working with the land, and it's very to me it was very much like a a climate uh, angle to it. So yeah, I, I totally it's it's everywhere. Yeah, I think all all stories will be climate stories uh, as we move forward in some ways. Yeah. I mean, a couple oh, of people said it's it's the story of our lifetime, uh, as a couple of people said. Yeah, Julie. Go yeah, ahead. Jump in on that real quick and just say that um, to encourage anyone who's doing work on climate, um, don't worry too much about where the work will end up or what people are looking for. Uh, if you make really, really strong work and you're creative, you'll find a way to get it out there. And, and I think that that's a better thing to uh, take to heart when you're working. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on, on kind of what, what future stories uh, might be or what these variants on telling the stories of climate change might be? Sure. I mean, I think I completely agree with something Isaac said earlier, which is, you know, that the apocalyptic storytelling has gotten us to where we are. And we're at this really interesting moment where it's like, okay, what's next? Um, you know, I can, I'm thinking about that personally, like in the context of Antarctica right now. And I, you know, think that Antarctica has become this sort of like token for uh, <laughs> symbol, symbol of apocalyptic world endings. It's like, okay, ice sheets are in collapse. Um, the ice caps are melting and that has become totally synonymous with this a little bit of like doomsday end of the world mm -hmm. narrative, which, in, you know, frustratingly, as I think, especially for scientists who work there, makes it bizarrely easy to tune out. It's like, OK, we know the glaciers are disappearing, like people are so used to it um, being sort of coded in that way that we have grown immune to it or desensitized to it. So I've been trying to think about reframing our human relationship to Antarctica as also like a place of birth or possibility. Like when we think about why 
human civilization takes the shape that it's taken, that's partly because of Antarctica's stunning stability over the last 6,000 years. Like uh, geologically speaking, it's really rare for those ice sheets not to move very much. Um, and they've been pretty still for this period that we've, human civilization has bubbled up in the way that it has. Um, so I've been trying to like think about like, what if we think of Antarctica as a mother? What if we think of Antarctica as a wellspring? What if we think of ourselves in relationship to it as a reciprocal relationship? And um, then coming up with a story that, that can map that reframing of this space is sort of, you know, that's what I'm at work at right now. And I'm writing this book about choosing to become a mother. Um, as climate change accelerates and and then going on this like totally bizarro scientific expedition to the calving edge of the Waits Glacier. So, you know, that's like, I've just got my head so deep in that project. So that's like a very specific answer to that question. But I think in a larger sense, um, another way of putting it, this is something that my my doula told me as I was preparing to give birth. She said, you know, two women can have the same birth experience. It could be a C-section or it could be a, a unmedicated birth. We'll have the same, the same outcome and one will experience it as trauma and one will experience it as transformation. And the one who got to make a lot of small decisions along the way will experience it as transformation. And the one who felt like it was being done to them will experience it as trauma. And so I try to think a lot about that as I think about climate change storytelling. What does it mean to encounter a bunch of small decisions along the way, as opposed to feeling like this is something that's being done to us or that we're doing to ourselves, but without a lot of agency. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in that, those two things. That's great. I mean, I feel like, yeah, I mean, that's a, a pretty fascinating way to look at it. Um, I hear my two-year-old in the other room right now getting ready for bed. And, you know, I think about the future and that through that lens, you know, what, uh, what might her life be like. And, and I, and I feel like, you know, she's, she's in this time of, of growing and learning about the world and not really thinking about doomsday apocalypse, climate fatigue, you know, end sickness, nurdles being dumped in the Mississippi. It's one, one of my notes here. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I, I think we're, we're looking at it through a certain lens now. And I do think that as as things progress through the decades to come, it'll, we'll be looking at very different stories. We'll be looking at this through very different lenses. Uh, people will be living through something very different. It, it's a period of great transition. And, totally. And it's like a shock that. for us. Like we didn't think this was going to happen and now it's yeah. happening and like our whole worldview has to switch. And I feel like the little ones are going to like, have it as their worldview, which is just a really different place to come from. Um, they don't have to move through that like incredible grief maybe that we did where it's like, what? The earth isn't stable, ah! <laughs> I see a couple of questions here actually that maybe we'll end with as we're getting close, very close to the end of our time, but um, two questions very similar. One from Klaus Jacob uh, at the um, at Columbia, who says, "Do you find a conflict between your artistic instincts versus activist urge?" And a very similar question from Aviva Romani that says, "Can meaningful art be separated from activism anymore?" Um, so, I, I got, you know, thinking about that, you know, what you're you're looking at, you're you're telling these stories, you're you're engaging with these communities, you're working as journalism, as journalists, you're working as as documentarians. But also it is in a sense activism. I think that's maybe what people seem to be gathering from what we're talking about. Like we're not, we are we are somewhat activist uh, in our choice to be doing this work. Um, I can touch on that. that. Yeah. Um, I'd say that, um, you know, I always, I tried to draw a line and then um, managed to always connect people to information. I don't see that as activism at all. So people are need to know what number to call when something blows up or something smells bad. You know, just make everything handy, and make things easy for them. But uh, when the Trump administration uh, took over, um, I kind of changed a little bit. I was like, well, I'm going to help when I can help, and you know, so I'm not 
I'm not out there um, protesting and telling people to keep the oil in the ground. Um, but um, yeah, I kind of cross the line a little bit more these days <laughs> uh, with uh, with that stuff, you know, uh, because uh, like, like Elizabeth Rush said, you know, we're in the middle of the change. So, you know, that's so that's where it's it's um, something made me change, and and it was the Trump administration. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, you know, going going off of that, like I wouldn't say I consider myself like a quote unquote activist either, you know. And I think um, uh, I'm I'm not. This isn't an original thought to me, but you know, someone said like this is going to take all of us, and then like kind of doing whatever you can do well, like climate change is going to need you, or like the, the sort of reckoning with climate change is going to need you to do that. And like, I'm not a great activist, but I do think I'm a great. I mean, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm a better storyteller than I am an activist, you know? Uh, so I think that's sort of what I feel called to do. And then, you know, another thought that I sort of absorbed from somewhere along the lines was like, you know, if you look at the, uh, the battle for the right for gay marriage, um, like a lot of that was one, obviously, you know, legally through activism, but also just kind of through this like gradual osmosis, osmosis or whatever you want to call it, of everyone just kind of talking about it and it becoming just something that everyone sort of accepts as, you know, a, a, a right. And I think um, you kind of look at the way, you know, going off of what Julie said about the Trump administration, the way I think that media got bolder uh, with just, rather than saying like, well, Trump stretched the truth here, you know, I think you'll just start saying, no, this was a lie. Trump lied here, lied here. So I think the same way I think people who cover climate change, I think it's getting easier to to talk about it without like you don't need to do like both sides isms where you're like, well, some might still say that this is a natural occurring da da da, or like we can't always draw the parallel between this extreme weather and this this. So I think in that sense, like the world has made it easier to not like have to be an activist to make these points because I think it's just. Uh, becoming more accepted it's 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 entered the culture in a way that like i actually feel is uh it makes me feel hopeful yeah yeah i mean i uh, it's i would sort of reframe what's being asked there and say like can you even make art or can you write stories today without like incorporating climate change without considering these issues can you responsibly you know tell stories that that don't look at what uh what we're going through right now um and I, I myself, am, I don't consider myself an activist, but I definitely um, feel as though that doing this work is important. Uh, I, I said it before, but a couple of you said it's, you know, it's the story of our lifetimes. It is kind of the important thing that's going to, it's an existential uh, threat to humans and many, many other species and ecosystems. And to not engage with it would be, you know, <laughs> would be would be my question. Like, how can you not engage with it? But um, yeah, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts about uh, artist, artistic instant, instincts versus activist urges or, you know, the marriage of wanting to tell these stories in a, in a creative way? I mean, it makes me think a little bit of two things, an anecdote. Uh, maybe I'll end with the anecdote because that's more interesting. But I'll just say, you know, I do sometimes think about how I spend my time and I completely agree that I'm a better storyteller than I am a better activist. Um, and with my son in the world, I've also started to be like, well, I still, I want to like put in a little energy in a way that feels useful to making, creating some of the change that I'd like to see a little bit closer to home. So like I started, uh, showing up to meetings of a, of a local activist group called Nationalized Grid, which is like about transitioning energy infrastructure in Rhode Island. And, you know, I've gone to like two of their protests. I don't feel that my presence there is like particularly useful, but I have written like a couple op-eds for the pro Joe and um, to try to kind of spread the word about what they're up to. So, you know, like I find myself falling back to my writer hat, but um, trying to elevate the fight for green, affordable energy in the state where I live feels important. Um, 
And then, so the other thing I'll say is like an anecdote. And I think it's a funner thing to end on, which is just, you know, I went on this trip to Antarctica on an icebreaker full of scientists who devoted their lives to studying climate change. And a story came out by another, I, by a journalist who was on board while we were sailing to Antarctica that was sort of about uh, the, the scientists not being activists in the era of the Trump administration. And they were, I think, really rightly peeved. They were like, we have devoted our entire effing lives to climate change. And now here you are um, reporting on us and you know, claiming that we're not activists. Like we literally are spending months away from our families at a time <laughs> to try to figure out really idiosyncratic questions around you know, will this particular ecosystem enter a period of accelerated collapse? Like, how dare you not call us activists? So I think we are all contributing as best we know how to make this, um, you know, both a just transition and one that like, you know, every inch of a degree that we can keep the planet from heating, every fraction of a degree that we can keep the planet from heating is a win. And I think, you know, everyone who's involved in this uh, professionally is an, is an activist in some way, shape or form. Um, yeah, so I'll leave, I'll end there. I think that could be a great place to end the panel on. Um, we're a little, little past eight o'clock now, so um, I'll wrap it up and, and let people get get their kids to bed or get to bed themselves. But um, thank thank you thank you all so much for being here tonight. Really, it's it's been a pleasure to talk more with you about your work and your backgrounds and your passions. Um, and I hope that we can keep the dialogue going. I, um, and I and I encourage anyone uh, uh, here attending the conference to go visit some of the other panels of, of artists. Um, upcoming as well, because I think it's really important to, to listen to these creative voices, these, these people who are helping us tell these stories uh, to a wider audience beyond just the academic and the scientific world. So thanks again for being here. I'll give you a round of applause. <laughs> I wish thanks, we had an audience here. Thanks a lot for organizing it. Yeah, thanks Nathan.